In this tutorial, we will go through the SPSS function of data exploration. Uh, and we use this function when we have data that we want to check for its accuracy as well as, com as its completeness. So we can look for missing data points. We can look for data points that are outside of a normal or expected range of scores. We can also use this function to test for some of the assumptions of normality, which we will use when we're using data for parametric versus non-parametric testing. We'll also use this function to produce some basic descriptive measures, the measures of central tendency, variance. We can also use it to come up with percentile ranks, and we can also use it to create some simple histograms, which can, again, demonstrate and describe um, how the data is uh, working relative to other data points. So in order to do this exploration, we are going to select the Analyze menu, go to Descriptive Statistics, and then choose the Explore option. And in the decision box here, we first of all have to choose which variables we wish to do this data exploration on. Um, and again, you can choose multiple variables simultaneously. You don't have to just do one at a time. You can do multiples. We're just going to do one at a time for the purpose of this demonstration. So let's go ahead and choose age as the variable we wish to analyze. So we move it over into the dependent list section. And now we need to choose our options as far as what we want SPSS to do for us as far as exploring the data. The first place we can go to is the statistics button, and this is where we're going to get to choose some of the output that SPSS is going to give us. And so we're going to ask for descriptors, which includes the measures of central tendency, uh, the mean, median, and mode, as well as uh, standard deviation. It's also going to give us measures of skewness. Um, that we can use to determine if we have normal data. We can also ask for the confidence intervals for the mean, and typically the default is the 95% confidence interval. If you wish to know the 99th or the 90th or whatever other uh, parameter you wish, you can change that. We're also going to ask for SPSS to identify any outliers for us, and again, this can be used to identify data points that are outside of a normal range of measurement. For example, if we're measuring body fat percentage and someone's body fat percentage is entered in as greater than 100%, then we know that's an, in, that's an inappropriate measure, and so we'll be able to identify that and deal with that. We can also ask for percentiles, so it'll give us the percentile ranks um, for various data points, so it'll give us the 25th, the 50th, and so on. Okay, once we've selected these options, we click Continue. And then we can go to the Plots button. And this is where we can ask for SPSS to give us stem and leaf diagrams or histograms um, or one or the other. At this point, we can also ask SPSS to perform some normality tests. In other words, these are tests that will tell us if the data is normally distributed. And then we can click Continue. And then we're ready to run the analysis. So then we can go ahead and click OK. Now as the output window loads here, we can look at several areas and we'll start with a box at the very top. And one of the things this will be able to tell us, first of all, is the N, the number of subjects that we have, but it will also tell us if there is any missing data. In other words, if there are any subjects in this data set that have a missing data point or a missing value it will let us know how many of those are occurring so that we can go back and fill in a, fill in a data point or determine how we're going to deal with that particular subject if they have missing data. Okay, the next area we can look at is we can look at some of the measures of central tendency. So here we see the mean score in this case of age, which is almost 50 years old. Here we have the 95% confidence intervals. Okay, the lower bound of 49.67 and the upper bound of 50.18. And remember, the confidence intervals are giving us an idea of what 95% of all possible samples, what their range of scores might be. So even though the mean of our sample is 49.93, the 95% confidence intervals are telling us that any other possible sample we collect, it's mean age could range anywhere between 49.67 and 50.18. OK, 
Okay, we can also see the median score, which is 49. We can see the standard deviation for this particular set of scores, which is 8.67. We get a minimum and maximum score, and we can also see the range. Okay, the next important uh, point we want to look at is this skewness value. Okay, and remember this is going to give us some idea um, whether or not we have normal data. Now this skewness statistic can, can be positive or negative. If there is absolutely no skew, if it is a perfect normal distribution, that skewness score will be zero. Okay, and so the closer that score is to zero, the more perfect or more normal this distribution is. Now, very often distributions are not perfectly dis normally distributed. We're going to have some skewness, either in a positive or negative direction. We can have a certain amount of skewness that falls within an acceptable range or an acceptable amount. And so we can use this skewness score to determine if our skewness, if it's there, falls within an acceptable range. And typically what we do is we take this standard error of the skewness measure and we double it. Okay, so as long as our skewness statistic is less than this doubled standard error, then we can assume we have within reason a uh, normally distributed data. We can also use what's known as the rule of one, in which if the skewness statistic is less than one, 1 1.0, then we can consider that to be essentially normally distributed. Now that is, the rule of one is the most liberal way we have of determining skewness. In other words, uh, we could still have so, you know, a fair amount of skewness, but um, a skewness score of less than one is still technically considered to be normal data. The next most stringent measure is the measure we just talked about, this skewness score. And if we double that standard error um, and use that as our criteria for determining skewness, then that is a little less uh, liberal and a little more conservative, a little more stringent. And then the last measure we have of uh, determining skewness is, uh, which we'll talk about in a few minutes as we move down the, uh, the page here, and we'll talk a little bit more about that last version. So in this case, with this skewness measure, if we use the rule of one, we would say that this um, distribution is not skewed because its skewness value is 0.192. But if we double the standard error, uh, of 0 0.037, that gives us a standard or a value of 0 0.074, and obviously this value of 0.192 is is greater than that doubled value. So using this criteria, we would say that this distribution is skewed, and it's probably not appropriate to be used in parametric statistics like t-test or ANOVAs. Okay, the next thing we can look at is percentiles. Again, as I mentioned. SPSS is giving us given us scores um, at the given percentile ranks. So the score at the fifth percentile is 37, the score at the, four, the 50th percentile is 49, and the score at the 95th percentile is 64. So again, we can use that to report percentile ranks. Okay, the next piece of data uh, that we can look at are where SPSS is identifying for us extreme values. Now, these values are being identified as extreme because they're at the upper and lower end of the range. Now, having a, an age of 70 is not considered to be um, extreme in the sense of being outside of the range of possibility, but if we had a score of 700 for um, an individual, then obviously that would be an inappropriately entered data point or there had been some mistake made in data entry. So this is one way we can identify if there are pieces of data that have been uh, entered in that, that don't make any sense, that aren't appropriate. And what's useful here is SPSS identifies the subject number for us if we have a data point that we want to investigate a little bit more, so it makes it a little bit easier to find that. Okay, now so going back to this idea of testing for normality, um, the last and most stringent test uh, we have, we can use to test for normality of data, is the kolmogorov smirnov test. And a compatriot of that, or another version of this kind of test of normality, is the Shapiro-Wilk um, test. And so what these, again, are doing is testing for um, whether or not we have normally distributed data. 
Now these two tests are the most stringent. So for example, if you're doing very high stakes research, maybe you're testing a new drug or maybe you're testing some kind of a medical device or you're testing a treatment in which there could be um, significant risk or harm potentially to subjects, we will typically test for normal data using one of these two tests. If we're doing research that isn't high stakes, um, that, that doesn't have a high risk for a potential of type 1 error or type 2 error when we do hypothesis testing, then we can typically using, use the doubled standard error for the skewness statistic. Now, one of the drawbacks of the Smirnoff test, the KS test, um, the fact that it is very stringent, but it tends to be a little more biased towards the center of a distribution. In other words, it, it somewhat ignores, doesn't completely ignore, but somewhat ignores the tails of a distribution. It doesn't take into account those scores as strongly as it does the scores in the middle of a distribution. So if you have slight deviations from normal in the center of the distribution, it's more likely to give you the result that you have a non-normal distribution. Whereas if the tails taper off consistently, like you would see in a normal distribution, it somewhat ignores that. Um, and so the drawback of this is if even if you have a slight deviation from normal in the center of the distribution and the rest of the distribution is pretty normal, you might still get the result back that this is a non-normal distribution. And so what we do is we look at the significance value here and if it's less than 0 .001 then we would say that it is a non-normal distribution. And in this case this is less than 0 .001 um, and so using this very stringent criteria for normality, we would also say that this is not normally distributed and therefore it most likely is not appropriate for parametric statistics like t-tests or ANOVAs. Okay, so the next thing we can look at here are the histograms that were produced or was produced for um, our data. And again, if we look at this histogram, you know, we're looking for that, that nice normal bell-shaped curve um, that we would expect to see and obviously we do not see that. We see a skew here and this is what we refer to as a, a right skew or a positive skew. Okay, now we can also see a stem and leaf plot um, for the same data and then we can also see what's known as a QQ plot which gives us some idea of what the distribution looks like. And again, a normal QQ plot, these dots should form pretty much a linear line. And in this case, they obviously do not. They form a curvilinear line, which again is some indication that we have a non-normal distribution. Now, another way to again double check these when we think about normal distributions is going back to our measures of central tendency up here at the top. Remember, one of the rules of the normal distribution is that the mean the median and the mode should be the same value or at least very close to one another. And you can see here the median and the mode, or sorry, the median and the mean are very close to one another, um, but they're still different enough that it, that it can skew the distribution. Okay, so that should summarize how we do the data exploration function. As I mentioned, this is very important to make sure we have accurate data make sure we have complete data, and also so we can make sure we're testing uh, the assumption of normality so that if we're going to use an outcome or um, a set of scores for parametric statistics, then we need to make sure we accomplish this and we make sure we can make then make a decision. Do we have normal data? Then yes, we can use parametric statistics. Do we have non-normal data? Um, then we need to think about a non-parametric uh, technique. But again, depending on the type of research you're doing and how stringent you want to be about making that normality decision, we have a few options as far as how we determine if we have normal data. We can use the rule of one, we can use the skewness score, or, or we can use uh, the more stringent Smirnoff test um, or uh, some other uh, normality test that we have available to us.